this is Chris, and this is your 2022 Flying Cloud 25 office with a hatch. We're going to start here at the front with the solar guards. This center solar guard will open outward, reach up on either side, level it out. Once you've got the solar guard open, you'll be able to open the front window. The front window on these trailers opens outward and the solar guard is blocking it. So before you can open the window from the inside of the unit, you're going to have to come outside and free it. <clears throat> All the rest of the windows that open can just be open from the inside. None of them are blocked except for the front center window. But I do want to mention that they tend to stick to the rubber gaskets, especially in the summertime. So if you've undone the latches at the bottom of your windows and you're pushing on the stalks on either side, if the window doesn't open readily, do not force it. Come outside and free it with an old credit card, a plastic scraper, maybe even the end of your finger. Opening the center solar guard will also allow you to open the side solar guards. There are rubber gaskets around the edges of all of these solar guards, but over time, leaves and dirt are gonna get past them, and the windows that are behind the solar guards on the side will get dirty. The only good reason you have to open those solar guards is to clean the window behind there. The screws that hold it shut are here and here, and they have a T-shape, so you'll take your screwdriver and stick it in the hole, you're gonna give it a quarter turn, they're gonna come out of the channel and they're gonna hinge away from the trailer. Make sure that when you're doing so, if it's windy outside, that you have a good grip on them. If the wind flings it up against the side of the trailer, it might put a crease there. Now, down below that, we've got a storage compartment. This unit has twin beds in the front, so we're gonna find three storage compartments. This is the largest of the three. These storage compartments are secure and dry. The rubber gaskets are doing a good job of keeping the water out and they can be locked with a key. The light inside there will need to be turned off manually. It will not automatically go off when you close the doors. This trailer has also had the lithium battery upgrade. We've got your battery box right here in the front. Because these lithium batteries were installed outside, they're the heated version. There's a switch over here on the side of the battery box that'll turn those battery heaters on and off. When you're camping in the trailer and it's colder than 30 degrees outside, you need to make sure that the heater is on so that you are able to use the full capacity of your lithium batteries. These lithium batteries are sealed. There's no need to check any water level. They're going to give you an extra volt over your standard AGM battery, and they will discharge further and recharge quicker, and they will facilitate the use of your solar cells a lot more. One thing we do recommend on units with lithium batteries is that if you have the option at your storage facility, you need to try to keep it plugged in all the time. That's gonna help extend the life of your lithium batteries. Now on the side of the battery case, on what they would call the curbside, you'll find a plug for an extra solar panel. It's already wired into your batteries. And next to that is the handle for the spare tire. If you remove the cotter pin and the slide pin, the handle will drop down, the spare tire will slide out. It's the same tire as the, tire, the rest of the tires on the trailer on a plain steel wheel, so it's gonna be an 80 PSI tire. You've got your tongue jack here. The tongue jack has a light. Switch to up and down. On this tongue jack, you need to make sure you let it stop before you reverse directions. If you go rapidly back and forth between up and down, you're gonna pop the fuse that's uh, between the tongue jack and the batteries. Manual crank that comes with the trailer will fit down on a little silver stud inside of here. So if it's not working, you'll be able to manually crank it on or off the tow vehicle. If it's not working, check the fuse first. It's wired directly into the batteries. Here we've got your propane service. This trailer will come with 30 pound propane bottles that are already full. In between these bottles, you have the same automatic regulator. That automatic regulator switches internally. So if they're both open, when bo one bottle runs empty, um, it will automatically switch over to the other bottle internally. However, on this regulator, you'll find a little post that you can use to point at one bottle or another. This trailer does not have gauges on your propane bottles. I would recommend you run one open and run one close, and also that you rotate the uh, little post over and point it at the bottle that you had been using, so that way it reminds you when you go on your next camping trip, this was the bottle that I was using last time. Now, on this side of the battery box, we're going to find an external propane port. That port will feed off of your onboard bottles. It is a low-pressure pre-regulated service. You can use that to run a little camping stove. I've even heard of folks using it to run a little space heater. Around the corner, we do have your gross vehicle weight and tire pressure sticker. Again, it's 80 PSI on your tires. You want to make sure you maintain that pressure for best towing and also best tire wear. Below that, we'll see one of four studs that will manually draw your stabilizers down. This trailer comes with manual stabilizers and a manual crank to do so. Remember, these are just stabilizing jacks. So before you bring these down, you need to make sure that you have already leveled the trailer 
and that you have disconnected your tow vehicle if you're going to. What you do not want to do is operate the tongue jack on the front with the stabilizers down. You'll put too much pressure on one end or another and you will cause them to collapse. Please remember to bring them up before you leave. If you begin to drive away with them down, unfortunately they will be bent at best, more than likely just torn right out from under the unit. Next to that, we're gonna find a black tube. That is for your sewer hose. This is where you'll store it when you're not using it. That tube will hold up to 15 feet worth of collapsible sewer hose. And then above that, we're gonna find another storage compartment. We'll find another one just like this on the other side of the trailer. Heading back this way, we do have your outside shower. Now when you're boondocking to get water pressure here, you will have to turn on the onboard water pump. When you are connected to the city water connection, the city water connection is gonna feed every faucet in the trailer directly. So you will already have water pressure here connected to the city. This trailer also has an on-demand water heater. The default for that water heater is on, so if the trailer is turned on and one of your propane bottles is open, open the hot water valve and within 10 or 15 seconds, you'll also have hot water out here. Next to that is where we'll find the fill port for the onboard fresh water tank. Just a gravity port, so stick your water hose in there and fill it on up. The tank monitor on this unit is on the far bulkhead. When we get inside, I'll show you how you can set up so you can look through the window here and watch the status of all your tanks as you're filling and emptying them. But remember, if you overfill the fresh tank, it comes out of the vent port next to the fill port and not somewhere inside the trailer. I still recommend you cycle through the water in there every two weeks to 30 days. After two weeks, that water will begin to taste a little stale if you're drinking it. And after 30 days, especially if you're storing the trailer out in the heat, that water will begin to smell very bad. The drain for the fresh tank is gonna be in between the two tires. It is a white plastic petcock with a little flag at the top. Simply rotate that flag around, point it towards the rear of the trailer and it will slowly drain. Down there is where you'll find your two main low point drains for winterizing as well. You have two brass valves with red handles one each for your hot and cold water line. Typically down here in the south, when we winterize these trailers, we'll connect an air fitting to the city water connection. Instead of pressuring that city water up with water, we'll pressure it up with air, open those valves, and use that air pressure to push all the water out of the trailer. City water connection is here. This is where you'll connect your water hose at your camping site for your on-demand water. Remember, Airstreams have built-in water pressure regulators. They are 50 PSI, and below that, we're gonna find a waste tank cleanout valve. The waste tank cleanout valve puts water directly into the black waste tank, which is the one the toilet empties into, and it's designed to help you flush that one out. Your waste cleanout is down here. There is a light in case you've got to connect or disconnect at night. These tanks are going to be labeled waste holding tank and auxiliary tank, and the handles are also color coordinated. So black tank on the left and gray tank on the right. Always begin with the black tank. Before you pull the valve, I want you to connect to the waste cleanout valve and fill it full. This is a gravity drain, so as soon as you pull that valve, the water just comes out naturally through gravity. I will recommend you fill it as full as you can, so that way you have the maximum volume of water to carry all of that solid waste out. Again, you'll be looking through the window and watching the status. Fill it up to 80, 90, or 100% and pull the valve. The water will come rushing out of this port much faster than it goes in here. So when the tank is basically empty and you see the flow diminish, I want you to close the valve. I want you to fill it right back up to the top with fresh water. You're going to fill and empty this tank two or three times until that flow goes from muddy to clear. I want you to kind of wash it out. And once it's clean, close the valve, let a little water backfill into that tank so you've got something in there for your chemical to dissolve and diffuse into. Fill it until the very first number pops up on the screen, whether that be four, five, or six. Shut your water off. Go inside right then and add your chemical into the toilet so you don't forget. You want to leave a little chemically treated water in that waste tank all year long so as you're towing the trailer around it's going to slosh around in there it's going to help keep it clean that'll make your clean out much faster come back outside and do the gray tank second the gray tank is going to have mostly soapy water from your sinks and showers by doing it second it'll help wash this pipe out do not ever open both valves at the same time if you do the black tank and the gray tank will cross contaminate each other and if you were to leave your valves open at your camping site you'll end up drying the waste tank out you need to keep the valves shut Use the capacity of the tank and flush it out when you're done. Coming back here, we've got your camp power coming in. This is going to be a 50 amp unit. It's 50 amps to run both air conditioners. You can run it off of a 30 amp service. The 30 amp service is going to limit you to one air conditioner. 
And you can also drop it down and plug it into a standard wall plug, which is going to typically be a 15 amp service. The 15 amp service will not allow you to use either air conditioner, and you really should not use the microwave plugged into that as well, but it will keep the batteries charged. It'll allow you to get the refrigerator cold. You can watch TV, turn the lights on, and use the water pump. This is the shore cord that comes with the unit. They're 25 feet long. These smart plugs have caps. So there's actually a plastic cap that's going to go over the end here to keep it covered. When you're storing it, keep dirt and debris out of it. Plugging it in is very simple. You just push it in, just like so. Below that, we've got a cable and satellite port. These are labeled cable and satellite, and they're going to terminate in different places inside the trailer. We'll talk again about that once we enter the trailer. Below, behind that, we've got the exhaust for the furnace. These furnace exhausts, especially down here in the south, are susceptible to those mud dauber wasps. We sell screens that you can cover them up with that'll keep those bugs out of there. All right, so the awning on the road side, or what you folks might refer to as the driver's side of the trailer, has one little hook style travel latch. You wanna make sure you rotate that out of the way. We're gonna come over here, we're gonna grab the strap. We're gonna pull away from the trailer. We're gonna capture that strap right there on that hook. We're gonna come around to the back of the trailer. So the awning on our rear does not have a latch. It doesn't need one. We're gonna grab the strap, we're gonna pull it out. The stalks that hold it out have to be rotated all the way around and captured here. They are too long to try to go this direction. So make sure you rotate all the way around. On the back, you'll take the strap, you'll roll it up on itself. There's a little bit of Velcro here to help hold it out of your view. Coming around to the curb side, we're gonna shut the door just so we can see a little better. Now all the travel latches on this one are already undone. You have the same hook style one and then these on either end that you'll need to rotate out of the way, just like so. Now on the curb side of the trailer, it's very important when you're pulling the awning out that you're pulling away from the trailer and not straight down. If you pull straight down, you might end up scratching the side of the trailer with your tool. So grab the strap, pull away, grab a hold of the awning strap and get rid of the tool so it's the awning that you've got a hold of and keep pulling it out until you see this flap drop out. Make sure you've got a hold of it until you can get down here to the arm. Grab the arm, place it up here on the head and push it forward to lock it. We'll come down to the other end and do the same thing. Once we've got both arms locked into place, we can start to extend it. There are four of these notches and you can do up to two notches at a time before the arm begins to bind. I'll come over here and we'll do two on this one. So one and two. Now we'll come back here to this other end and we'll do a couple more. Now we have three and four. We're fully extended on this side and this side still has one more notch and you'll notice I've got it at an angle. <clears throat> you can leave the awning out at an angle to block the sun, but do not leave it at an angle to allow the rain to run off. These are just sun shades. They're made of aluminum. They're very lightweight. They cannot take the torque of a heavy wind or heavy rain. So if it starts to blow or pour, make sure you fold it away. The strap on this side, you will roll back up on itself. And eventually you'll be able to tuck it into this loop here. We also have an LED light strip across the top. That light strip will dim and the switch will turn it off but folding the awning in does not automatically cause the light to go out. I'm not sure if you could see but as I pulled the awning out the light was already on you could not tell that it was on when the awning was closed so do remember to close or to turn the light off from the switch right by the entry door. Now putting the awning away is as simple as bringing it out. Make sure you drop your strap back out. We're going to come down here to this end we're going to drop a couple of notches You'll notice as I do this, I'm not just holding this release uh, knob out. I'll pull it out and then I let it ride so it slides back into that hole. If you were to hold it out, typically it'll go all the way down and that's when the arm is going to tend to bind. We'll come down here, we'll do a couple more. So there's one and two. At this point we can pull here to release this forward arm. We're going to take the arm, we're just going to set it right here on the travel wrist, right, right there. Down here, we've got one more notch. At this point, when we go to release the arm, make sure you're holding on to it so the awning doesn't come trucking in on its own. Pull here to release. 
place it in its travel position. And you can either hold on to the flap, sometimes you can just kind of put your hand up here until you can get down to the strap. And if you need to use the tool to return the awning, you can do so when you do. Run the awning in until it connects with the little aluminum cover. Let it snap in those last couple inches so it's nice and tight and it's not wrinkled and you still have access to your strap. If you fold the awning up and you can't get to the strap, get two people, one on each end, just grab the arms and physically pull it out until you see the strap drop out. Make sure you remember to re-engage your travel latches if you're leaving your camping site. If you're staying in the same camping site for several days, You'll be pulling the awnings in or out as the day progresses. It doesn't necessarily have to be locked down on site, but it must be locked down on the highway. At 60 miles an hour, these awnings tend to fold out, and that's that. You wanna pinch the arms together, split this back in its slot, and simply tighten it back down. Absolutely nothing wrong with standing in the doorway and using your hand. I'll typically just capture these stalks behind these little acorn nuts so they're not bouncing around. One more time, if you need to use the tool to put the awning away, every time you do, run it in until it connects with the little aluminum cover. Let it snap in those last couple inches so it's nice and tight and not wrinkled. Now, this model has a hatch on the rear. This is the handle that'll open and close it. You can also lock it from here. You're gonna give it a, oh, a quarter turn and that'll lock it and then you can actually return the handle position back to neutral and it still stays latched, unlatched, back to neutral and it'll just open right up. You're gonna have a hard time opening this up when you have the awning out. The awning is not designed to hold this and this will run into it as it opens. So I'm gonna recommend against opening the hatch with the awning on the rear out. You have a bug screen here that we can drop down. That'll allow you to enjoy this without those little critters coming inside. Back here we'll find a plug that's also going to work off of the inverter as well as one of the vents for the furnace and below that we've got the wet storage compartment, the bumper or the trunk storage. Remember when this one's closed it's not completely sealed. Don't put anything in this one that you're concerned with getting wet. Simple compression latches keep it shut. Brian I'm going to have you stand back here and I'm going to go inside and I'm going to show them how to get the table off. I think you'll be able to see that a little better from out here. On this one, it's actually super easy. All you have to do is just kind of pull it up. And the table legs just unscrew. Very simple. Now this will be made into a bed. Make sure you pull both table legs out. You're just gonna place the table down here on the cabinets. These little feet will help hold it in place and pull the small end of the cushion off either end and set it right there in the middle. Hi everybody, Aaron Vaught, president of Airstream of DFW and Vaught RV Centers. And I just uh, wanted to interrupt this video for a brief moment uh, to thank all of our customers for all the awesome surveys that they have done for us um, for our service work. In fact, uh, we have a higher score than the factory itself at the moment, so I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, also to announce because of that success and the success of our same day service program, uh, we've decided to expand our service center. Uh, we're going to double, maybe even triple in size. It's all going to be indoor. A lot of great things coming. But again, it's all about putting customers first in customer service. And cannot wait to show you what all we can bring for all of our Airstream customers. So please come and see us. If you have any questions about our same day service or you'd like to make an appointment, just call the number below. We're happy to explain it to you or get you in here and take care of you.
Now, back to the video. All right, so we'll come around the corner here. We're gonna head up to the front. One more outside storage compartment right here. In this one on the rear bulkhead, you're gonna find a mouse hole. In that mouse hole is your third exterior low point drain. So remember, you've got the two brass ones over on the other side of the trailer near where the drain for the fresh tank is. Those are your mains. This is the secondary to clear the line that feeds the water heater. The water heater is right next to it. This is an on-demand water heater. It does have a little 0.4 gallon tank, but there's no drain plug. There's no add node rods. For you folks, it'll be basically maintenance free. The control panel that you'll interface with is in the bath bathroom and the default for it is on. So if the trailer is powered, the, control, the water heater control is already powered as well. But being on demand, you've got to draw water through it to get it to do anything. Out here, we'll find a master disconnect switch. That's going to let you disable the entire unit. There's also a pressure relief valve here. This water heater is propane fired only. So you must have propane and one of your bottles open to make hot water. The other thing you want to remember is every time you do make hot water, there will be a hot exhaust coming out of here. On this particular unit, it is on the same side as your main awning. Just make sure you haven't accidentally blocked it with something flammable like the back of a fabric chair. Heading towards the back, we've got your external AC port. Remember, this port is only going to be available when you're plugged into your shore service. The inverter will not send power out here, and it's just your standard 15 amp AC. Above, we've got the back side of the vent hood. This vent hood has two little tabs that are keeping the door shut. You just push them up and out of the way to allow it to vent. Make sure it's secure when you're towing. The entry door has a little catch here. Push that out of the way to get the door closed. These doors were built in pairs. You must always close them together. Never close the entry door onto the screen door. Over time, that will cause it to flatten out. So, paired together every time. Remember the latch is here. The latch is just for the handle. The deadbolt is here. The deadbolt is an actual post. Make sure that post isn't sticking out when you go to close the door, but use it when you're towing. It'll do a much better job of keeping the door shut. And also make sure you do not leave your keys in the door in either one of these spots when you go to open the door all the way. There's not enough room for them back there and you're likely to put a dent in your trailer. The entry step is very simple on this unit. You're just going to take the lower step. I want you to push in on these two hinges until that lower step is straight up and down. Fold it onto the upper step, lift slightly to release the hinges, and then slam it up underneath. To get it back out, grab one hook or another and hold them up. Allow the step to just drop out. Make sure both sides are secure. And then to get the lower step out, pick up the rear portion of the step and push the front edge of the step to the trailer as you flip it all the way around, just like so. Now, Brian, as you follow me inside here, we're going to talk about the awning light at the top on a dimmer. The ceiling lights are also dimmable as well. Below that, you've got a little light for the entry. And at the very bottom, you've got the master disconnect switch. Remember, this disconnect switch will turn everything in the trailer off, including the refrigerator. On the other side, you've got a fire extinguisher just in case. And this is actually a little drawer for storage here. All right, so the radio is going to be here. This is actually a 12 volt radio, so it's going to work whether you're plugged into your short service or whether you're not. This radio can also be paired with your phone via Bluetooth. You're going to go to the source over here to Bluetooth. Press here to select. Go to connect new device. The code that will pop up on your phone is going to be a combination of the model of the radio. The radio is a JL Audio Media Master 50, so the code is simply going to be JLAMM50. We've got a DVD and Blu-ray player. It's going to play either disc. This one comes with the monitor for the backup camera. Behind here is where we'll find the termination port for the satellite. This is the office model, so it's going to come with a chair and a tabletop. This tabletop will raise. One interesting thing about lifting and lowering the table is that it is alternating current only. So if you are not plugged into the shore service, to get this to come up or go down, you have to turn the inverter on. This is as high as the desk goes. So Brian, trade me spots again, please. Here on the wall in the galley, we're gonna find the sea level monitor. This will give you your battery voltage. Now it's got lithium, so it's going to be a little higher than you're expecting. 14.3 is typically what you'll see plugged in on a lithium trailer. And then off of that, it'll start at about 
13.5, Fresh tank is 33% full, so right at a third. Gray tank is 13%. Black tank is 15%. Notice when I press the button once, within a few seconds, these digits will disappear. Press it twice, and you've got about a five minute window where it'll stay on there, so you can look through the window over here and watch the status of your tanks as you're filling and emptying them. Water pump will be turned on here as well. This is an on-demand water pump. So you turn it on, it's gonna pressure up, it's gonna stop, it's not gonna come back on again until you create a demand. Standard 15 amp AC here. This one is not gonna be powered from the inverter either. On the left-hand side, we've got your solar monitoring panel. The solar system in this trailer is automatic. So as long as you've got sun on the panels, it's always charging the batteries. You don't turn the solar on or off. And with the lithium batteries, the solar system is probably gonna work much more effectively. Next to that, we'll have the inverter. We're gonna turn the inverter on with this button here. The inverter is gonna provide alternating current when you're boondocking and all you have available is the direct current that's stored in your batteries. This is a 1000 watt inverter and it's only powerful enough for the desk and the televisions and the DVD player. Hold your finger on the power button until you see this display flash like that to get it to turn off. Next to that, we've got the vent hood and below that, the range. We're going to turn the knob with a little flame towards the arrow and then strike the igniter. Remember the lid on this stove is made of glass and if it gets too hot it might shatter so let it cool before you close it. Switch here on the right when you switch it all the way up it's just the knob lights and all the way down it's going to light the oven as well. The oven will not light from the igniter you must use a long lighter or a kitchen match. Over here, we've got your refrigerator. This refrigerator is an ACDC fridge, so you know it rocks. Please cut that terrible joke out, but I had to say it. All right, so this is an ACDC refrigerator. So when you're plugged into your shore service, it's actually running off of alternating current. When you pull the shore plug, it's gonna automatically switch over to the house batteries. Again, you don't have to do anything to make that happen. This refrigerator will take three or four hours to get completely cold. I'm going to recommend that you pack it full of food the night before you leave, plug it in and give it all night to get nice and solidly cold. Without an external power source, you've got about a five or six hour window, where as long as you keep the door shut, all the food inside will stay cold. But because it runs off of the house batteries, if you leave the master disconnect switch by the main entry door on, the refrigerator will stay powered and your tow vehicle is charging your trailer as you're headed down the road. So if the trailer, I'm sorry, if the refrigerator was totally cold when you set out, it will not draw the batteries down further than the tow vehicle can keep them charged up. Across the top, you've got your master power switch. This power switch is gonna require about a four second press to get it to turn on or off. If you just press it, it'll beep when it's turned on, but it does not just automatically turn off. You've actually gotta hold the button down for about four seconds and then it'll turn off. And turning it back on is the same thing. If it's off and you just press the button, it does not automatically come back on. You've gotta actually hold your finger on here until it comes back on. Temperature setting here, five is the coldest, one would be the warmest. The refrigerator here is set on five. The freezer is also set on five and it has a night mode. When it's in the night mode, it's gonna dim the lights here. It's also gonna make the fan inside there quieter. So it's not being obnoxious and keeping you awake while you're trying to sleep. We'll head this way, we have your wardrobe. Inside the wardrobe on the rear bulkhead, you're gonna find a couple of clips to store those table legs when you've got it made into a bed. Shower door is made of glass and this tab is keeping it shut while you tow. You don't wanna let the shower door come flying open while you're headed down the road, if it slams into something, it might actually shatter. You can actuate the tap from inside the shower to help keep the door shut while you're showering. So if you turn and bump it with your elbow, you won't knock it open and spill a bunch of water on the floor. At the top, you've got a manual vent fan. This one gets pushed open. A little red button's gonna turn it on and off. Pull it closed. Close line inside here that you can stretch across and tighten down. It's gonna be good for your lightweight items. Shower head has a pause feature, so you can pause that head while you're soaping up and to help you conserve the capacity of your gray tank. Go ahead and step past me, Brian. We'll go over the bathroom real quick. In the bathroom, turn the light on here. You've got the same manual vent fan pushed open, a little red button turns it on and off, pull it shut. These lights can be turned off here as well and it'll still operate from the switch. Next to that switch is where we'll find the control for the water heater. Again, it is already on. You can turn it off by pressing that red button right here. Set to 118 degrees, it will get as hot as 124 degrees or as cool as 96 degrees. Being on demand to get it to come on, all you have to do is create a demand. You'll get a little indicator when it begins to work. And once it lights, we'll see a flame here in the middle. 
When the temperature crosses about 110, you should already get some heat out of it. And remember, this thing's gonna hold the temperature until you run out of water or you run out of propane. Turn it off to get it to shut off. Very simple. Flushing the toilet, there's a lever on the right hand side. Partial step's gonna fill the bowl. Full step's gonna flush it. Your tank chemical's gonna get dropped straight into the toilet. And you'll find the storage for your toilet paper under here in this top cabinet. Man, it's at the bottom of the countertop. All right, in the bedroom. This trailer comes with a manual crank for your stabilizer jacks, and you also have the awning tool here. This cabinet over here. The shelves can be removed, and you can hang your clothes in there as well. We'll find the breaker and fuse box underneath this bed here. AC on the left, DC on the right. These are your standard blade fuses of various different amperages. GFI reset is gonna be the second from the left on the AC side. So if you trip the GFI on any plugs, you must come here to reset it. All right, over here, of course, we've got the dimmer for the bedroom lights. The bedroom light switch will not control the reading lights above the beds. They've got their own little switch. You just click it and turn them off. Finally, the HVAC control. When the HVAC control panel itself is dark, the first press of any of the buttons simply turns the backlight on. So you'll end up pressing the buttons twice on this in a lot of cases. So we'll press it once to get the backlight to come on, and then we'll press the power button. And now you can tell that it's on. Zone one is gonna be the forward or the bedroom air conditioner, and zone two will be the main cabin or the rear air conditioner. You're gonna operate it with the mode button. The first option is always gonna be the air conditioner. You'll see a little hourglass pop up here. The fan's gonna come on first. The hourglass disappears whenever the compressor kicks in and that's usually within 30 seconds of the fan kicking in. All right, so there we have the fan coming on. We're still waiting on that hourglass to disappear indicating that the compressor has kicked in. And there it goes. Now, if you'll look down here, you'll see a auto and a fan symbol. That's for the overhead speed control. There are three speeds. Press the fan button here to get it down into low, medium, or high. Give it a chance to let it react. They don't react immediately, but leave it in auto as the default. So that way, when you turn the control panel on, the fan doesn't come on immediately. Now with the mode button, we're gonna have an auto across the top. The auto across the top is gonna switch between the AC and the heat pump depending on your target temperature and your ambient temperature. Heat pump is next. Just like the air conditioner, it will require you to plug into the shore power to get it to work. It's only gonna work at 100% efficiency down to about 50 degrees. Any colder than that, you're gonna to wanna to switch over to the propane furnace. That's gonna be powered through zone two. So on zone one, after the heat pump, you have a fan only option and then off. We'll switch zones and we'll fire this other zone up. Now plug into a 50 amp service, you'll be able to get them going at the same, both going at the same time. On a 30 amp service, it's gonna limit you to one air conditioner. It's simply gonna be whichever one you turn on first, not one specific air conditioner. It's only one set of ducting, so one air conditioner under normal circumstances will cool the entire trailer. Of course, if it's summertime and it's really hot, you need to try to find that 50 amp service so you can run them both. Zone two is gonna operate just like zone one. So you've gotta give it a few minutes for it to fire up. We're gonna see that same little hourglass symbol. The fan is gonna come on first, and then once the hourglass disappears, that'll be indicate that the compressor is kicked in. All right, so same options in the same order on zone two. So air conditioner first, auto second, auto switches between the AC and the heat pump. Heat pump is third. And then on zone two after the heat pump is where you'll find the furnace. The furnace is a separate unit. It's gonna turn off the overhead unit. It's gonna come on down below. Even though the furnace is controlled through the same control panel as the air conditioner, it's gonna run off of 12 volt when you're boondocking, but you must have propane to heat it. So open one of your bottles, turn the furnace on. It's a 10 second wait period before it lights, just like that. And then once you turn it off, it's gonna to continue to run for about two minutes to cool itself back off. On zone two after the furnace, we've got that same fan only option. The fan only option will not work on auto. You have to select low, medium, or high and then off. Make sure that both zones are off before you turn the control panel off. So that way when you turn it back on, it doesn't suddenly come on to whatever you had been using previously. Ryan, step back here to the rear of the trailer. We'll go over the Fantastic Exhaust Fan. This is your Fantastic Exhaust Fan. It is fully powered. 
The switch that's going to open and close the lid is right here next to the knob. The switch will be disabled when the speed selector is on zero. You can enable it on one through three. So we'll put it on one and now the lid will open. We'll turn the fan on over here. Remember, this is an exhaust fan. It's drawing air out. You're going to use it when you're cooking, use it when you're showering. We've got a little thermostat here, so in between these clicks, as the temperature crosses that threshold, it'll turn the blade on and off. It's got a built-in rain sensor, so if it gathers enough moisture, it's going to close on its own. When it closes on its own, it will shut itself off. Remember, the lid is made of plastic, so don't ever tow the trailer with the lid open. Finally, you'll find a 4-amp glass fuse here next to the speed control. If the fan blade isn't working, check that fuse. Folks, I hope you enjoyed your 2022 Flying Cloud office with the hatch. Thanks for watching our video. If you have any questions or any recommendations on content you'd like to see, leave a comment below. If you enjoyed our video, be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again from Airsmith DFW.